Hey, online fam, so glad you're tuning in today. I want to tell you about AC21, which was absolutely amazing, a live conference 21. People were healed and transformed. And more importantly, we had an encounter with Jesus. But drum roll, please, come on somebody. AC22 is going even higher. And I'm happy to announce today that tickets are on sale right now. I'm telling you, this is a conference that you do not want to miss. It's happening October 12th through the 14th in our Orlando campus. And in celebration of what's happening with AC22, we want to drop some special messages from AC21 right now. So check this out. Hope you enjoy. John chapter 17, verse 23. This is a very significant uh, portion of scripture. This is Jesus. He is in the garden. This is the night before he is going to head to the cross. He is praying these last prayers before he is going to fulfill what he has come to do. And he's praying these prayers and he's praying prayers for his disciples and he's praying prayers that they would stay in unity and then he switches towards the end of his prayer. And he begins to pray a prayer for you and I. I want you to think for a moment that at this critical juncture in Jesus' life, as he closes his eyes and he lifts up this prayer to his Father, that he sees a picture of your face in his mind. He says, and I ask not only for these disciples, but also for those who will one day believe in me through their message. And I pray for them to all be joined together as one, as one, as one, even as you and I, Father, are joined together as one. I pray for them to become one with us so that the world would recognize that you sent me. I pray that they would become one with us so what? So that the world would recognize that you sent me. For the very glory you have given to me, I have given to them so that they will be joined together as one and experience the same unity that we enjoy. You live fully in me and now I live fully in them so that they will experience perfect unity and the world will be convinced, they will be convinced that you have sent me, for they will see that you love each one of them with the same passionate love that you have for me. This morning, I would like to talk around the subject, sounds like heaven. Sounds like heaven. Yesterday, I had to have a little laugh as uh, Pastor Earl was, was up here talking about Christians that never listen to non-Christian Christian music. Anybody grow up in church that's in here today? There's a few hands. Okay, that's, that's great. I am a pastor's kid. My parents were pastors. And, uh, and I grew up in the kind of church that you couldn't wear jeans because you were going to hell. You couldn't go to a movie theater, you were going to hell. First movie was Bambi. By the way, horrible movie for a child. They kill the mother. What were they thinking? Um, wore too much makeup going to hell. Praise the Lord, I have been delivered. They printed a dress code in the church bulletin. This is the kind of church I grew up in. Lovely. They were doing their best, okay? They were doing their best. You know, they, they felt like this is what, you know, needed to happen. Uh, but needless to say, it was a little bit of a legalistic upbringing. So in the midst of this upbringing, Christian, I mean, uh, secular music was for sure a no-no. But I thought that I was very rebellious as a child because I would sneak and steal my father's radio go into the closet, and I would take a tape, young people. <laughs> a tape predates a CD. You don't even know what that is, and that's okay as well. Probably decor somewhere at your favorite coffee shop. Because what do we do with them now, right? 
Uh, and it was a plastic device that you would put into a very large boon box. And you would have to wait for the radio station to play the song you like, and you hoped, you hoped, you hoped that you recognized it in time to press the play and record button at the exact same time so you could get the whole song. So recently, Benny and I were watching uh, a Whitney Houston special on TV, and I was like, oh, I love Whitney Houston. He looked at me, he said, you didn't listen to Whitney Houston. I said, yes, I did. Bobby Brown, too. He's like, name one song. Every Little Step I Take. It's the only one I know. Isn't that the only one he made? No, I'm just kidding. Sorry, Shane. I'm sorry. No. So there's a little bit of a problem. I live in Las Vegas. You understand that. And, you know, we have concerts that come through all the time. And so my girlfriends that did not grow up like me are always like, hey, let's go to this concert. Let's go to that concert. And I have a little bit of an issue because in my mind, I think that I know music, right? I am musical, but I don't know music. I think I know music. I think I know Michael Jackson. So I was so excited when the one show came to Las Vegas. I was thrilled. I thought if I know anybody's music, I know Michael Jackson's music. I don't. I know five songs, right? I know bad, right? I mean, I know like, I, I know a few songs. I don't. And I find myself in these concerts and I like, I'm dancing to one song and all the rest, I'm like, nom, 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 nom. Some, like some of you in worship, it's okay, but nom, 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 P's and Q's and P's and Q's, and I'm just like, ah. We went to U2, I didn't know what they were singing. The last U2 song I knew was, I still haven't found what I'm looking for in the 80s. I, 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 I don't know music the way that I thought that I did, but there is something interesting about music. Do you know that we are two times more likely to recall a memory if it is attached to a song. There's something amazing about an artist like a Michael Jackson whose songs outlive them because there's something so anthemic, there's something so so, so enchanting. There's something that draws you in. There's something that transcends time. There's a message. There's a sound. There's a cry. There's a question. There's a want. There's something that encapsulates a generation. There's something that goes beyond generations. And you can begin to hear it in the music and it begins to draw you in. And sometimes you begin to hear those songs and it can take you back to the exact place and the moment and the time. There's something so special about music. I think that it is no coincidence that an angel called Lucifer was the angel of music in heaven. I think that there's something that draws us in. I believe heaven has a sound. I believe that there is echoes in it throughout time and eternity. And I believe that there is something as followers of Jesus that we are meant to to carry that is attractive, that is alluring, that makes people want to come in and find out. It is a sound that transcends time. It is a sound, I believe, that is already birthed in the heart of man, that is yearning and longing for something more. And they look this way and that way, and they turn to other kinds of music and other genres trying to look to fill that void. And I believe as followers of Jesus, you, and I carry that sound. Recently, uh, Benny and I were having a uh, discussion. We haven't yet instituted those uh, family meetings on Tuesday like Pastor Ken and Pastor Tabitha, so we still have those intense fellowship discussions. <laughs> we're going to need to get right on that Tuesday night meeting for sure when we get home. And we're having this uh, intense fellowship and uh during this time this is how it started uh, some friends of ours invited us to um to go and spend some time with them and uh and i got the invitation and he got the invitation 
And so he uh, said to me, um, you see that our friends text us and they want to get together with us. Do we have any time open? Well, just to give you a little context for this story, um, this, these particular friends who I do love dearly and we have years of relationship with but have recently become very vocal about certain opinions um, you know, in regards to society and culture that I personally don't agree with. And so, um, not being like Jesus, I'm sitting there and I'm washing my face and he says, do we have any time this month to meet with them? I said, no, we are all booked. <laughs> and because my husband is so straightforward and always says what he means and never says what he doesn't mean and does not get innuendo whatsoever, um, he says, really? Completely booked up? I say, yep. He said, wait, like he's starting to get it, right? And so we begin to engage in this discussion, and it begins to get very heated because I am extremely frustrated, and I don't even want to associate with them because of his opinion. And so um, this fight ends really well with him sleeping in the guest room and me in our master bedroom. And uh, I wake up in, sorry, that's too real. Uh, I'm sorry, but Pastor Ken said boobies like three times yesterday, so I, I didn't think anything was off limits here. I mean, who says boobies in church? So I wake up in the morning, and I'm praying, and, um, and obviously I'm like, oh, gosh, you know, that was, that was not a good night, and the Holy Spirit just speaks to me. He says, Wendy, would, would you go to dinner with sinners? I said, Lord, of course. Would you go to dinner with people that lived a lifestyle that diametrically opposed your worldview? God, absolutely I would. Okay, so you would go to dinner with these people from the world, but because you don't agree with an opinion of a brother and sister, you don't want to get together with them as if friendship with all people is a 100% full endorsement of every opinion that they have. <laughs> Denny and I started talking about this and, you know, in those moments, and he's like, Okay, so this is the way it's going to be. We are going to check everyone's Instagram feed to see what they like and don't like before we go to dinner with them. I was like, sounds good to me. <laughs> Unity is by far an overarching theme of the New Testament. Look at the writings of Paul. My God. I was like, every single church he writes to, I mean, he's addressing different reasons, but the foundation of everything that he is talking about to these churches is unity. Stop siding with this person. Stop claiming this person. Stop trying to do things by the law. You know, stop. And all this disunity that was constantly going on, Jesus, in his last prayer to the Father is asking that we would be one. Father, let them be one. Let this be the sign to the world. Let th that they would know that I am real, that I am loved, that they would be loved, but let them be one. Unity is by far one of the most poignant points that is being made in the New Testament. N.T. Wright was recently asked, and he's write, written extensively on Paul. I was telling Benny I had to laugh. I was so excited as I was researching this message that I downloaded uh, his book on Paul. It's like $83. And I opened that book up. Now, I did not go to seminary. My parents were pastors. I grew up in the church. I did go to some Bible college, but not seminary. I can't read that $83 book for the life of me. I don't know what those words mean. I'm going to have to get Pastor Ken to come over and like give me, a, give me a thesaurus just for the words in the book. So instead, I YouTubed him. <laughs> he said this. He says, the Apostle Paul overarching theme is unity, a student asked. If the Apostle Paul came back, 
Would he be shocked by the disunity in the church? And T. Wright says, no, he wouldn't be shocked. He wrote about it in every book he wrote. He knew that this was already an issue. It's been an issue since the beginning of the church. What he would be shocked about is that we don't care. We have allowed the apathy, we have adopted the culture of the world, we have allowed the cultural thinking of the world around us to invade our thinking. But we were never meant to think like that. We were always given a new mind in Christ. We were always given the mind of Jesus. We were always meant to think like Jesus thought. So if we're meant to think like Jesus thought, that means we are meant to think unity. Jesus talking to his disciples, sitting around the table, taking Passover in John 13. And he's talking to them around the table. Think about the last words. The last words that he's going to share with his disciples before he heads to the cross. He says, so I give you now a new commandment. A better way to say this would be a higher commandment. Love each other just as much as I have loved you. For when you demonstrate the same love I have for you by loving one another, everyone will know that you're my true followers. When you demonstrate the same love, love I have for you when you demonstrate the same love the disciples didn't even know what they were hearing when you demonstrate the same love that I have for you they didn't even understand they could not comprehend in this moment they still didn't even get the full picture when they're hearing these words when you demonstrate the same love this is impossible this harkens back to pastor Ken's message yesterday mutual submission in a marriage is impossible outside of Jesus it is impossible it is impossible it is impossible to begin to address the disunity it is impossible to begin to address the racism and the bigotry and the sexism it is impossible to begin to address the classism that exists within the, our very own churches without it first being a heart issue as God as Jesus invades our hearts and begins to change us from the inside out it is impossible to demonstrate the same love of Jesus the willingness to lay down our own agendas the willingness to lay down our own desires desires, the willingness to lay down our own will, our own wants, our own needs, and begin to prefer one another above ourselves. It is impossible without Jesus. It is impossible. Oh, listen, we love, we love to quote Galatians 3. There isn't Jew or non-Jew. Yes, amen, hallelujah. Rich or poor, yes. Male nor female, amen. But don't start going Calvinist, Arminian. If you don't know what I mean, it's probably better. Or just ask Pastor Ken or Pastor Tabitha later, okay? Egalitarian, complimentary. And again, if you don't know what I mean, don't ask. It's just a big fat mess. Right wing. Left wing. Are you ready for this one? Vax, no vax. Oh, God. People leaving churches. Dear God. There's not Jew or Greek, but if you got the vaccine, mm, lack of faith. What? What are we talking about? It's so funny. We don't need a political system. Everybody's like, oh, politics is the enemy coming against the church. Oh, the pandemic is the enemy coming against. 
We don't need an enemy coming against the church. We are our own worst enemy. We have weaponized the gospel, and not in the good spiritual warfare kind of way. We have weaponized the gospel against one another using scriptures to put other Christians down, using scriptures to lift our, ourselves up while putting them down. We don't need anybody else. We do a great job by ourselves. Like I said, my parents were pastors, and I have been doing this a long time. Don't let the Botox fool you. Oh, I was going to say something, but I was feeling a little too comfortable because I'd say it in my church, but I don't know if I should say it in your church because you don't know me that well. <laughs> so so uh, one of my best friends, one of my best friends, we have our birthdays both in August, so we always do a joint birthday party. Her name is Equilla, and she always laughs at me because I'm always telling her all the stuff I'm putting in my face. She happens to be African-American. And she was all like, what'd you do now? What'd you put in your face now? And I was like, hey, you want to come with me? She's 60, mind you. She's never done a thing to her face, whereas I have done everything. And, uh, and she said, I said, you want to come with me? She says, girl, black don't crack. I says, well, white does. <laughs> it cracks bad. Real, real bad. Has cracks and cracks and cracks. I've been around a long time. Been around long enough to see different movements come and go. Watch the different waves that come through. And watch the different movements that say, we're going to unite the church. And this is no shade. I don't think any of these things go to waste. I don't think any time that we lift up the name of Jesus or we gather together is ever a waste. But unity was never meant to start from the outside in. Unity was always a matter of the heart. Unity is predicated on love. It is anchored in Jesus, but it is fueled by thinking like Jesus. It begins in a heart that has accepted the love that Jesus has for us so that we can in then turn, take that same love and give it to others. And by others, I'm not just talking about the world. It is easy to love the world. Well, semi-easy because there's some really crazy people out there. But for the most part, like 75% of them, it's pretty easy to love them. The real problem is loving the people in the church. It begins here, but it's worked out right here. Right here. Unity and love. Diversity and unity are not synonymous with each other. We look around a church like this that is so beautiful, that is so similar to Church LV, which I think looks like what heaven is going to look like, and it's so special and so unique and so rare. It's to be protected. But just because we see diversity doesn't mean that we also walk in unity, and just because we walk in unity doesn't mean that we also embrace diversity, but we need both. We need both. Oftentimes we can think of the word love and we think, I'm going to call the band up now. I know it's early, but I want to give a little bit extra time at the altars. We look at the word love, and it's easy to think that the antithesis to love is hate. But the antithesis to love is not hate. It is selfishness. The antithesis to love, we could say it this way, is self 
focus. Let me say it one more way to you because we might as well just call it like it is. The antithesis to love is insecurity. Something else that came about in this discussion that Benny and I were having. As tends to happen when you are in a heated debate and clash of wills. You start out on one subject, but you quickly digress to others. Am I the only married person that ever does that? And so sure enough, historical data finds its way into our discussion. Uh -huh. I was telling Pastor Tabitha, I was like, I, I have a gift. I, it's just my personality. It's not because I'm so much like Jesus, although I think I am. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm really not. But um, uh, I, I do forget. I literally forget. Like the next day, Benny would be like, I'm so sorry about last night. And we were fighting. And I'm like, oh, what were we fighting about? What were we fighting about? Like I literally forget. So it's great. It's a gift. Um, Benny, his mind is like a filing cabinet. Like he's literally like 1985, June 5th, 6.05 p.m. Oh, yep, got it. What did you have a question about? You know, it's amazing. But for some reason, when I get in these heated discussions, my recall, oh, my God. Amazing. Amazing. I amaze myself, quite frankly. Anyway, so here we are. We're in this discussion and... And uh, <laughs> I digress, of course. And, uh, and I go to my go-to. I go to my insecurity. And do you know that up until last week, I couldn't call it my insecurity? I would have told you it was my passion. I hope I can be this vulnerable with you, family. I hope I can... I'd have told you, no, I'm, I'm a warrior in this fight. I, I got to make change. But I didn't realize it was actually an insecurity. And until I allowed the Lord to begin to heal the insecurity in my life, I was not going to affect any change because my heart was not pure. We're in the middle of this fight and I bring up an issue kind of related, but not really. And then he says these words, oh my God, the women issue again. And it was like, it finally hit me. And I thought, dear Jesus, I am 45. You can start playing. You don't just have to stand there. Thank you. I'm 45 years old. We've been married almost 23 years. Feels like 25. Pastor Ken said, we've been married 22, 20 of the happiest years of my life. I said, 12, 15. <laughs> yeah, we agree. It's okay. <laughs> the women issue again. And I thought, right he's right when is this going to stop being an issue I get it I get it I've gone to preach at churches where the husband has to come up and like introduce me and then give the altar call because he's the covering and I'm not allowed to give the altar call because I'm a woman. I get it. I go into churches that don't affirm what I'm doing or don't affirm my calling or don't affirm my title or don't affirm my position. I get it. I get it that there's a large portion of the body of Christ that would not recognize what I do or who I am. But I sat in that bathroom the woman issue again. And I thought about my church who loves me. I thought about my husband who's constantly affirming me. I thought about every opportunity that I've ever been given. I thought about parents that pushed me. I thought about the army of women that I'm raising up behind me. 
that will just go further, that my ceiling will be their platform. I thought about the most important young woman that I will ever empower, and that is my daughter, Bella. I thought about the young men that we are raising to respect and honor and love their wives when they get married. I thought about, I thought about our staff who looks at me, respects me, and honor me, and I thought, oh, dear God. What I thought was something that I had to lift up as, as my war, what I thought I had something that I had to lift up as something that I had to fight against was actually a deeply seated insecurity. It was causing me to set up boundaries and not being able to live in unity with believers. And if I am not able to lay down and say, God, I give you this insecurity because baby, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks about you. It doesn't matter what any other man thinks about me because I am called and I am anointed. I am set apart and I am chosen. I am, I am, come on, I am sanctified, I am gifted, I am anointed, I am empowered to begin to preach the word of God, to lead, to teach, come on. See, I'm not mad at the world for becoming more disunified. I'm not mad at them. It's a setup. This is a setup. If we as a body of believers could understand that our unity, it might be messy. It for sure will be complicated. It absolutely will be painful. But it is mandatory that we begin to stop judging one another for our theological or opinions or political differences and instead begin to gather under the bond of our heart towards Jesus Christ and understand that we cannot, we can never, in fact, do it in our own strength, but by the grace of God, but that can only happen. I say, God, I don't want to carry this insecurity anymore. I don't, I don't want to be that girl with a chip on his shoulder. I don't want to be the one judging every person that doesn't affirm women. I'm going to let their wives do that. Sorry, that was so much shame. Revelation 5. Verses 9 and 10. See, I've always read these verses and thought it was a picture. I always read these verses and thought, oh, this is what heaven looks like. I always read these verses and thought, this is what John observed when he went to heaven. But this is not what John observed when he went to heaven. You see, there's something in the heart of man that is listening, that is looking. There's got to be more. There's got to be something that fills this void. The world is looking and they're listening. Is there something different out there? They're looking in all the wrong places and trying to fill the void. But there is an echo of heaven that the church is meant to have. And it goes beyond worship and it goes beyond a song and it goes beyond uh, what, what the, 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 the rhythms and the tone and the sounds. And it comes from the very heart. And it is the heart of Jesus working through us and that love that is working through us and choosing to think like Jesus and lay aside those differences and be joined together in unity. And this is what John saw. John says they were all singing. They were all singing. They were all singing. They were all singing this new song of praise to the Lord. This is the echo of heaven. This is the song of heaven because you were slaughtered for us, Jesus, because you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Your blood was the price paid. Your blood was the price paid to redeem us. You purchased us to bring us to God out of every 
every tribe, language, people, and group, and nation. Out of every tribe, language, people, group, and nation. Go back. Out of every tribe, people, group, nation. You have chosen us to serve our God and formed us into a kingdom of priests who reign on the earth. The sound, the sound, the sound. Jesus prayed that they would see us as one and know, and know your love, and know your love. I give you a higher calling that you would love one another as I have loved you. This is the sound of a heaven. It is the unity of the body of believers. Sometimes we like to relabel some of our hurts and traumas, and I'm not saying that they're not real. To be honest, I could give you multiple examples of things that happened in my childhood and why I developed this particular insecurity in my life. And I've worked through some of those things in counseling, yet I still found myself still found myself reacting instead of being able to say oh, it's okay I'm I'm secure in who Jesus made me so actually your opinion does not define me I finally just had to call it what it is because I wanted to be free don't wait holding on to it is only hurting you I just imagine if out of pride I, I held on to it. I think I did for a lot of years. I think I didn't want to admit that the problem was actually inside me. I think I just wanted to put it on everybody else. On every man that slighted me or said something about me. On every woman that didn't stand up for me and fight for me. And I just wanted to put it on everyone else. But at the end of the day, I realized I was the only person holding on to the bitterness and unforgiveness and insecurity. And I don't want to be that way anymore. Because I cannot love my brothers and sisters when I'm holding on to that. So that's what I want to open up these altars for today. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And you want to stand in that unity, but you know that deep inside you, there's, there's an insecurity that you have to just let go of. It, it's going to look different. It's going to have a different name. And that's between you and God. Bring it to him today. Bring it to him today. If that's you, we're going to begin to sing that heaven song, that second song that we sang. These altars are open. I want you to come down. We just have a few moments left until we transition. Let's lay it at the feet of Jesus today.
take this insecurity. Lord, for some of us, we've carried it for so long. The hurt, the pain, the shame, the condemnation, the words spoken over us, the things declared about us that are untrue. God, we've carried them for so long. For some of us, they've clouded our minds. Sometimes it's like we can't even think straight. We can't even look to the future. We can't plan or dream because those words and those thoughts, they stand in the way. It's like anytime we begin to dream about the future, we get flashbacks of things that have happened in our past and they begin to inhibit the dreaming and the vision that God wants to give us. And I say, today that stops. Today that ends. We surrender every insecurity. We surrender that trauma. We surrender those words. We surrender that pain to you right now. And we declare in Jesus' name, we are whole, body, soul, and spirit. 